Welcome everyone. My name is Gwenda B. Davey and I'm the chair of the Melbourne branch of the Friends of the National Film and Sound Archive. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge our Indigenous peoples. There are a lot of people with us today and many of you come from different locations in the state of Victoria or elsewhere in Australia. We recognise that we are all on Aboriginal land. We acknowledge elders, past and present, and any to any who may be with us today. We support all moves to constitutional recognition for Australia's First Nations and all moves towards reconciliation, justice and respect. Uh, and also welcome, particularly, there may be some people from overseas, I think. Well, it's a great honour to introduce Emeritus Professor Jenny Hocking, probably one of Australia's best known historians. We were privileged to have Jenny speak to us in person in January 2020 about her challenge to the National Archives of Australia to release what we now call the Palace Papers. A year and a half later, Jenny's going to talk to us today by Zoom about her campaign which ended successfully in the High Court. Please use the chat button for any questions or comments you have. Bruce Watson will call up as many as possible at the end of Jenny's talk. Welcome, Jenny Hocking. Thank you, Gwenda. Thank you, Bruce. And thanks to the Melbourne section of the National Friends of the National Film and Sound Archive and to everybody for coming today. I'm really pleased to speak to you, uh, this time by Zoom. As Gwenda said, I spoke to this group last year in what must have been one of our very last public engagements. We were able to actually speak in person, which was marvellous. And ever since then, I've pretty much done mostly Zoom meetings, um, although I've managed to get a few in person. So I'm really pleased that um, as somebody just said before, it is a benefit, I guess, of Zoom that we can have more people from further around Australia to actually join us today, which is terrific. But since we last spoke, we've had quite an extraordinary decision of the High Court of Australia um, in what's been called the Palace Letters case, but technically known as Jennifer Hocking v. the Director General of the National Archives of Australia. <laughs> and that is a decision 6-1, in my favour, so I'm in an emphatic decision that the palace letters between Sir John Kerr and the Queen during the period of the dismissal of the Whitlam government are not personal, as the archives and Buckingham Palace had always claimed, but are in fact Commonwealth records. And that meant that the letters came under the Archives Act. And that was the critical question before the court and had been for four years from the federal court all the way up to the high court. Because as Commonwealth records, as records under the Archives Act, of course they had to come under the public access provisions, the, uh, the open access provisions after 30 years as it was then, and now of course 20 years, which changed everything. It meant that they now had to be made available to be released. And so the instructions of the high court were twofold, firstly, that the National Archives were directed by the order of the High Court to reconsider my original application to view the letters. I had been trying to view the letters for more than a decade and they were instructed to reconsider that now that they were considered to be Commonwealth records. Secondly, and I think equally importantly in terms of the work of the archives that raises some significant questions, is that the High Court issued three cost orders, all of them, against the National Archives going all the way back to our first federal court challenge back in 2016. So this case in which our National Archives argued that these letters should be kept secret ended up costing the National Archives close to $2 million because they had to pay my costs as well as their own. So it's a really significant decision. It's probably the first time we think in the Commonwealth nations that what's called the Convention of Royal Secrecy, which was effected through this notion of personal, has been successfully challenged by a court. And I'll come to that later. 
But the first thing I want to say is that this was an absolutely tremendous team effort. Um, and I want to thank the legal team, which were just stupendous in working on a pro bono basis for four years on this case. It's a fantastic um, public spiritedness that, that we had from Anthony Whitlam QC, uh, Brett Walker SC at the appeal and at the High Court, Tom Brennan SC throughout the case, and instructed by Cause Chambers Westgarth. They were just superlative and I can't speak too highly of them. But we also had a, uh, a, a fundraising, a crowd, crowdfunding campaign that ran alongside it called On Chuffed, called Release the Palace Letters. And I want to thank everybody who contributed to that because it was a really important part of being able to take the case forward. And I think one of the really important questions is why did it take four years of legal action to have our National Archives release such significant letters that are, after all, held in our National Archives in Canberra for four, over 40 years, but which we couldn't see. Um, and that was purely because of that word personal. It had become a really powerful word in the sort of lexicon of archival um, uh, access questions, because as personal records, they weren't governed, as I said, under the Act. They had their own what's called instrument of deposit that is generally put by the person who placed the letters there. We were always told that the controlling person was in fact Sir John Kerr, that it was Sir John Kerr who'd placed an embargo on the letters, that it was his decision because they were his personal letters. It was only once the court case got underway and we asked for documents that it became clear that this was in fact the Queen's embargo. The Queen had instructed the National Archives within weeks of Sir John Kerr's death to change the original conditions and now make it contingent on the approval of the Queen's private secretary for us to ever look at them. So potentially that Queen's embargo was potentially indefinite. Now, if it wasn't for the, for the court action, we still would not know that. We'd still be being told that this was John Kerr's decision and his wishes. So again, a very troubling aspect of, um, of, of, of the archives actions, I think. The notion of personal is totally tied up with royal secrecy. And for those of you who may be familiar with the difficulties of trying to access anything to do with the royal family, you may have heard Julia Baird, for example, speak of her efforts to release the letters of Queen Victoria going back over a hundred years. Absolutely impossible because they're held in the Royal Archives in the UK where you cannot access any Royal Archives without their permission. And it was always assumed that the same thing would happen here. And our National Archives to their great discredit simply followed that without question. And the word personal emerged through the court case really as a total sophistry. This was a way of preventing access. There was nothing personal about the letters. We knew that. As Anthony Whitlam said during the court proceedings, it was never seriously suggested that there was anything like a personal connection between Her Majesty and the Governor General, Sir John Kerr. And of course, you know, it was a nonsense. Here we have two people at the apex of a constitutional monarchy being the Queen, an unelected hereditary body, and her representative in Australia, also an unelected appointed official, Sir John Kerr, discussing matters to do with the intense political um, upheaval in Australia at the time, and they were deemed to be personal. It was just a co by common sense alone. It was never, um, it, it was simply an untenable position. And it was on this basis, together with, of course, the material we gathered in support of the case that we were able to mount that case. What's interesting is that Buckingham Palace was informed of the case and was across the case from the very beginning. And uh, letters that were part of the submission put forward by the National Archives make that very clear. We see letters from Buckingham Palace to the Governor General in 2017, very strongly urging the letters to remain secret. And this is extraordinary when you remember that the court case is actually in train. The court case is looking at this very question. What is the interpretation of our Archives Act? Well, the Queen's private secretary then, as he was, wrote to, Buck wrote to Government House and said, well, uh, these letters are secret. They are following the Convention of Royal Secrecy. It is absolutely imperative um, that they don't be released. And uh, uh, they do not come under your Archives Act. So <laughs> totally preempting a decision of the Australian courts. There's a wonderful example of royal presumption right there in telling 
our uh, 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 government house how to interpret the Archives Act, which was, of course, the very matter under consideration by our courts. They also said that it was essential that they remain secret to preserve the constitutional position of the monarch and the monarchy. So, you know, I found this sort of hyperbole absolutely extraordinary that suddenly the simple desire to understand and know our history and open materials in our archives had become something that was threatening the monarchy itself. And so this submission is part of the archives broader submission Again, I find this troubling, put by our National Archives before the court to argue against the public release of our records held in Canberra. It was a deeply antithetical position for a National Archives, which is tasked with giving us access to archival documents to take, uh, particularly when you think that the Archives is very fond of referring to itself as a pro-disclosure organisation. But there's more, wait, there's more. <laughs> Equal to that is I find very troubling that archives put forward what was called a closed submission to the court. This is basically a secret submission. I've never seen it. My lawyers were never allowed to see it. It went forward to the federal court together with their open submission, which included submissions from Buckingham Palace, uh, presumably arguing very strongly about why we could not access those letters. Both those things I find troubling. I'm still yet to see that secret submission from this pro-disclosure organisation, the National Archives of Australia. And by the time the case went to the High Court, um, not only then were we facing Government House, the National Archives, Buckingham Palace, but the Federal Attorney General, then Attorney General Christian Porter, joined with the National Archives in a joint submission at the High Court, again, arguing against the release of the letters. So I think it would be something of an understatement to say that we faced a formidable institutional barrier when we were seeking access to the release of the palace letters um, by the time it got to the High Court. I find that absolutely extraordinary. And it's one of the things that makes this such a very important case and such a very important decision. And for me, the issue always was a question of history and a very strong belief that our history should be a public history. Never more so, I think, than for a contested history like the history of the dismissal of the Whitlam government. I'd been working in this area for more than a decade when I wrote a two volume biography of Gough Whitlam, the second volume of which was published in 2012. And if one thing had become clear from that, it was that the history as it had been told to us was a deeply flawed, um, a deeply flawed and incomplete, I think you'd say, um, history. It was one in which key elements were frequently forgotten, at times deliberately omitted. And worse than that, there were some aspects that had been uh, 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 quite deliberately distorted by key protagonists. For example, key protagonists whose role was carefully hidden for several decades. And I find that deception that was ongoing of the history after the events almost as troubling as the deceptions involved in the, his in the dismissal itself. So, I was determined to take the, the case if it was at all possible, both in the interest of a general in, interest in history, but also the specific history of the dismissal. I mean, archive, archives had been absolutely critical in unraveling what I'd called the received sort of dismissal history up to that point. We'd always been told this sort of central element of the dismissal was that Whitlam was refusing to call an election, which we know is untrue. He was intending to call the House Senate election. That's why he was at Yarralumla on the 11th of November 1975 to call that House Senate election. And we'd always been told that Sir John Kerr acted alone, that there was nobody involved in this decision except Kerr alone. He describes it a decision I made for my own part. The veteran journalist Alan Reid said it was a lonely and agonising decision by the Governor General. Now, we know that that's completely untrue and much of this unraveled because of my opening of Sir John Kerr's papers when I was researching Whitlam's biography in the early 2000s. And 
what we see there, and I think the most important revelation was the revelation of Sir Anthony Mason's role. Many of you will recall this at the time when it was revealed, he was a sitting High Court Justice at the time of the dismissal. Um, and we did not know until 2012, 37 years later, that he had for many, many months, going all the way back to March, 1975, been in discussions with Kerr, as Kerr describes it, guiding me, fortifying me for the decision that I was to take over several months moving towards a dismissal, including drafting a letter of dismissal for Kerr. This was an active role, a secret active role by a current High Court Justice in complete breach of the separation of powers, apart from the moral and ethical issues about behaving in secret and allowing the history to be unaware of that involvement for nearly four decades. Um, I revealed that in 2012, at which point Justice Mason, who I had spoken to, released his first and only public statement on it, confirming it um, and uh, acknowledging that this is pretty much as Kerr had indicated in his papers and as I had reported. And it's clear that if those archives had not been released, and apparently I was told subsequently that archives seriously thought of rescinding my access to the Kerr papers and um, preventing me from publishing it. But just think how the history of the dismissal would continue to be falsified if we did not know of that involvement. And it all gets to the critical fact that archives are central to history and, uh, 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 and, and particularly to a contested history like the history of the dismissal of the Whitlam government, which is now so vastly different from, um, from what we understood it to be, say, 30 years ago. So this book, which is my current book, I hope you can see that. I didn't put that on a slide. The Palace Letters is all of those things. It's a story through the courts. It's a story through archives. It's a story about the true history that had previously been secret of, of the dismissal of the Whitlam government. But overwhelmingly, it's a story of what to me was a fascinating archival journey. And I really wanted that sense of excitement about archives and what archives can bring to history to come through the book, because you've probably gathered I actually love archives. <laughs> I love sitting in archives and finding things that I've suspected but not been able to find evidence of. And it's, you know, I liken it in the book to like a mosaic where you look in hundreds of different files, hundreds of different archives here and in the UK, in the UK and I include the National Library in that and of course our own National Archives and gradually what takes shape is a picture of all of those things but it's bigger than any one of them and that's what happened with the dismissal and we now know it to be something very very different from what it was and I've been delighted with the reception of that book that what I tried to achieve in the sense of a political thriller if you like which is the common description that's come back to me that it reads like a detective story it's a, it's a courtroom drama and a political thriller they're all the things I wanted to achieve you know I love Agatha Christie, Hercule Poirot these sorts of things that take you on a journey through characters um, happenstance but also that bring different strands together and this book does that and I think fundamentally it's a pay into archives. It's, it's, it's a reminder of just how important archives are that all of it have been unavailable if the archives had continued to keep them about where the archives, perhaps some of the key documents, court case, and I think that's really important to know because here's the thing about royal secrecy. Royal secrecy is impenetrable and it's impenetrable largely because it's secret. How can you take a legal action or any action saying, well, I know these documents are really important. Here's a case as to why they should be released when you don't know what's in them. That's always been the great power of royal secrecy. You stop people looking at records, you cannot make a case for their release. Now, what we had in this case was this rare confluence of both the legal team able to work pro bono, prepared to work pro bono, but you also had these extraordinary documents I'd located in Kerr's papers because they revealed a certain extent of what was in the letters. We already knew quite a bit about the letters because of Kerr's papers. He described, firstly, he left extracts from some of the letters which I found in his papers, which was extraordinary. They weren't labeled extracts and palace letters, but again, 
from that process of marrying up what he'd said publicly with what we did know was in one of the letters, I had this light bulb moment, oh my God, these are extracts from some of the palace letters. The archives then confirmed that during the court case, just extraordinary. And clearly none of these things suggested they were personal, far from it. So all of these really helped our case. We also had um, a journal that Kerr kept in 1980, where he reflected on actually going to Buckingham Palace, reciting parts of the letters and pleading with Buckingham Palace to release them. He actually wanted them to be released. And that was another important factor because it was clear he didn't control the letters. There was a list of key moments in the dismissal in which he notes, Sir Martin Charteris's, that is the Queen's private secretary, Sir Martin Charteris's advice to me on dismissal. That's there in his papers. You could not get a clearer indication of the involvement of the palace in Kerr's decision to dismiss Gough Whitlam. And finally, I'll point to one other thing, which was just extraordinary. A series of letters between Kerr and the Queen's private secretary after he left office when he was about to publish his memoir, in which it's clear that the palace has vetted his memoir. So if you ever read Kerr's memoir, Matters for Judgment, in which he calls, calls it in the introduction, um, a, a book that he has written to tell the facts of the stories of 1975, just remember that he was congratulated by the palace for omitting any reference to his discussions with Sir Martin Charteris about the dismissal. So he has had that book vetted by Buckingham Palace and he has made sure he's removed any reference to the matters that are being discussed in the palace letters. It's, you know, all of these things I still find quite shocking. But this all fed into the legal action because it was a rare confluence, as I said, that enabled us to build a court case around those critical documents. They became, if you like, um, the sort of empirical spine of what went forward to the court, together with two chapters from my previous book, The Dismissal Dossier. And I've seen another historian describe that moment when their work becomes part of a legal action as feeling like their footnotes were on trial. And I completely understood that because <laughs> it is a very nerve wracking experience to know that two chapters of your work is about to end up in the High Court of Australia. And I had a call from our barrister, Tom Brennan, and he said to me, look, I want you to put together every single footnote in those two chapters, not just the sources, but the indication that the sources say what the book says they say. And it took about two weeks to do that because it's no easy task to go back and find every one of your footnotes three years later. <laughs> but I was very glad I did, and I'm glad to report they all held up perfectly. But, <laughs> You know, it's that level of um, interrogation um, that you need to be prepared for when you're making um, what became such a significant contest, contestation of what had previously been a received history. And I just want to say what a fascinating process that was. You know, it's like an alchemy where you're, um, what had been a historical, effectively a historical research project and, and process becomes part of a legal action. And I considered myself also very, very, um, very, very lucky and in a wonderful um, uh, uh, and rare capacity to be able to witness that. And I, it's one I'll be forever grateful for to the legal team for enabling me to be a part of that, because I think uh, seeing that historical and political science work transformed into a legal argument was was just a really enthralling process and I really hope that comes through in the book um, of, of what an intriguing journey that's been um, for me and I think for our history. We, we didn't even know until the court case began how many letters there are. I thought maybe there might be 40 or 50. This is how little information we knew. Governors General always report back as it's called to Buckingham Palace but usually once every six months or so. There were over 200 letters and I was absolutely shocked. And the way that came out was actually quite amusing because one of the key documents we had to work through at, through the court case and agree on between the archives and our legal team was what was called agreed facts of the case. And one of the agreed facts of the case was clearly 
you know, how many letters are they? What do they address? Who writes them? They're all written by Sir Martin Charter as the Queen's private secretary. And initially in an early version of that, the archives had acknowledged there were over 200 of them. That had been taken out in the final public version, but track change had been left on. And so by turning back on the track change, I suddenly realized, oh my goodness, there's 212 letters, which I immediately published that fact because it shows how very different Kerr's letters were from other governors general, vastly different. There's also voluminous attachments to Kerr's letters. He writes far more frequently. Um, he was quite obsessive. Sometimes he wrote four or five letters in a single day. There's a couple of times where he wrote that many letters in a single day. And his first letter is 11 pages with attachments. And I think the, the longest one is around about 44 pages with attachments. Absolutely extraordinary. Um, so, you know, the nature of the letters are different. They're unique. They show that something unusual is happening um, just in the nature of those letters themselves in the number. Um, two things to keep in mind when we look at what's in the letters, which I'll now come to, but two critical things to keep in mind institutionally are firstly, that the defining feature of a constitutional monarchy is that it is politically neutral. It does not engage itself in political matters. It remains above politics. It's, you know, there's a cold neutrality of the crown is how it's referred to. And you can see that on the Buckingham Palace website. They actually refer to that proudly themselves. The queen does not engage in political matters. The queen does not express a political view. That's why the queen does not vote because that would be expressing a political view. The second point to keep in mind is that as an appointed official, the governor general acts on advice of elected ministers. The, the governor general acts on advice of elected government, generally the prime minister. And that's been called the cardinal principle um, of the role of the governor general in a democratic framework, because the, there's no electoral mandate for either a governor general or for that matter, a monarch. They are simply appointed in Kerr's instance and hereditary in the monarch's interest. Political matters are not meant to be discussed they claim they are never discussed. And many of you would be familiar with the claims made before the letters released that they would show nothing other than polite chit chat and the charters would do nothing other than say, thank you for your letter, I'm glad you're well. Now the letters show none of those things. They show clear breaches of both those core requirements from the very first letter as I'll go through. And finally, I think it's important to just keep in mind, not an institutional matter, but a matter of relevance at the time is that all of these letters, the content of the letters are secret from the Prime Minister Gough Whitlam. And that's really critical because it means that the palace knows things that the Prime Minister does not. Whitlam knew as all Prime Ministers did that Governors General, as I said, write to the palace, but the expectation was that they did not discuss political matters um, because that's what they claim publicly and certainly that there were not this sort of voluminous day-to-day -day reporting on the prime minister as though he's a crypto criminal that we can see in Kerr's letters. They really are absolutely startling. If I turn to the letters now, because um, I don't want to run out of time, but what strikes you immediately, and I don't know how many of you have actually taken the time to, uh, I wouldn't suggest it, to read these letters, um, they really are distasteful, I think, is the politest way to put, um, particularly from Kerr's part. But what strikes you immediately is Kerr's excessively deferential tone. There's a sort of cloying obsequiousness in everything he writes, which after a time very quickly becomes almost humiliating as an independent nation to read that this is our governor general and the manner um, the manner in which he's writing, as Malcolm Turnbull says, as if he's writing from a branch office back to head office. It, it really is a, a, a quite, um, a quite distressing to read. And it says a great deal about Kerr's own insecurities, his need for approbation, his, for even the most banal matter. He is desperately seeking the approval of the palace. And the letters, many of them are banal, as I said. Should the curtsy by ladies continue in his vice-regal presence, he asks Charteris. Should there be four bars or six bars in the vice-regal salute? 
He even asked Sir Martin Charteris whether he should wear full mourning dress and decorations to his swearing in, because, you know, heaven forbid the Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam, has suggested that he might just wear a lounge suit. And what is both interesting and quite pathetic is that Charteris writes back to him and says reassuringly, you were right to wear mourning dress. Now, it's immaterial in many ways, it's petty, but the important thing is that Sir Martin Charteris is here saying against the Prime Minister's advice, you were actually right to go against the Prime Minister's advice in this petty matter of what you wore. But on the other hand, it's important because it's the beginning of a process through which Charteris overturns and overrides the formal advice of the Prime Minister. It's an undermining, which even in those early letters, they become confidants about. And that's what's disturbing about the nature of those, of those letters. Um, he even asks Charteris, you know, are the letters too long? Are they too detailed? He's asking for advice, feedback on his own letters. <laughs> are, they, are they too frequent? You know, it's as if nothing is too petty or too inconsequential, too humiliating for Kerr to seek the royal imprimatur from Sir Martin Charteris. And Malcolm Turnbull wrote a magnificent uh, forward to my book, The Palace Letters, and he says there, he describes Kerr's, and I quote Turnbull here, Kerr's sycophantic grovelling is stomach churning. And, you know, it absolutely is. It's, it's appalling to read, and it's very difficult to imagine that Kerr is the immediate past Chief Justice of the New South Wales Supreme Court. And here he is asking the Queen's private secretary, just an appointed public servant in the UK, whether his letters are too long. Uh, I mean, it's just staggering. But the second and far more significant feature, but it's related to the first, is just how political these letters are. Um, and, and from the very first letter, which is in August 1974, soon after the joint sitting, which is a famous joint sitting, often forgotten in the history, an absolutely important political and constitutional moment in, after the first double dissolution that Whitlam mm. called in 1974. Kerr questions the government's use of six trigger bills, as it was to call that double dissolution. Um, and he actually suggests to Charteris that he, he thinks that might be illegal. Now, the High Court is then considering that very question and finds it's perfectly legal. You know, you can use more than one trigger bill. It hadn't been done up to that point, but there's nothing against the Constitution. But he is un not only undermining, questioning the legality of things that the government is doing from his very first letter, from the very first letter. It's a total undermining of the government. And even more concerning is the Charteris engaged with Kerr on those political matters. Turnbull again writes that he had expected Sir Martin Charteris would reply with little more than a brief polite acknowledgement as we all anticipated. But Charteris and Kerr conferred on the political and constitutional circumstances of the time in considerable detail. And that is the truly uh, alarming aspect of the letters. Many people have asked me, <coughs> what was the first letter I looked for? thinking I might go to November the 11th or I might go to um, the advice on reserve powers. The first letter I looked for was actually early October 1975. And I'm going to try and bring it up on screen. Um, uh, but as a, a technological Luddite, excuse me if I lose the screen, but I'll do my best. Um, now, I hope it's there. Bruce, is it there? It is there. Well done. Thank you. Um, what is important about this letter and why I went to it, and you can see here, you know, we don't get a sense really of just how magnificently, uh, uh, if you like, uh, privileged these letters are. It's, it's heavy paper, it's a beautiful cream, uh, there's an embossed red uh, crown, Balmoral Castle. The, 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 the importance of this cannot be missed in the letters that Kerr is receiving and no doubt he felt that very keenly. The reason I went to this particular letter is that it's something Kerr had referred to in material I'd found before in his papers in his journal in 1980 and he refers to what is on the next page which is Prince Charles as you could see in this third paragraph there Prince Charles told me a good deal of his conversation with you. 
he reports in that journal, and I had no confirmation of it as correct until I saw this letter, that Kerr had spoken to Charles about the potential dismissal of the Whitlam government, September 1975. It's six weeks before he does so. It's two or three weeks before, no, it's a month before supply is even blocked in the Senate. And he is raising with, Char with Prince Charles the prospect that he might need to dismiss the government. It was an extraordinary revelation. And when I made it in uh, uh, Gough Whitlam, his time, um, uh, you know, several people claimed, well, quite rightly, well, there's no indication that letter even exists. Now we know it does exist. It's extremely uh, important uh, because it does confirm that conversation that Kerr had previously reported on um, and that he had considered the prospect of dismissing the government and that he'd asked the Queen through Charteris. Um, he was concerned that Gough might turn around and dismiss him and they spoke of those possibilities. So in other words, they spoke about the possibility of the dismissal of the government, something Whitlam was utterly unaware of, uh, especially two months before it happened. But they also spoke about what the Queen would do if Whitlam then, which was perfectly within his remit as, as, as Prime Minister, if he was then to rec recall the Governor General, having found out that he was considering doing so against his advice and behind his back. Um, it's, it's solely the decision of a Prime Minister whether to retain a Governor General in office or not. And so this is a critical letter. Um, he writes, if uh, that they discuss the possibility of the Prime Minister advising the Queen to terminate your commission with the object, presumably, of replacing you with someone more amenable to her wishes. There's no, to his wishes, there's no indication of that ever occurring whatsoever. And he says, if such an approach was made, you may be sure that the Queen would take most unkindly to it. There's no indication the Queen might take unkindly to Kerr dismissing Whitlam, but there's a statement there about the Queen taking unkindly to Whitlam potentially dismissing Kerr. Something I stress never happened. Now, these are powerful words to a Governor General who is considering dismissing the government at that time. And to quote Malcolm Turnbull again, this advice no doubt reinforced Kerr, reinforced Kerr in concluding that to forestall any risk of his own dismissal, he would need to give Whitlam very little or no warning of his intention. And that's been a critical factor in this. There was no warning for Whitlam. Even Sir Anthony Mason uh, acknowledges the enormity of the failure to warn Whitlam. And he says that he told Kerr if he did not warn the Prime Minister, he would run the risk that people would accuse him of being deceptive. And in this exchange, you can see the Queen has not only expressed a political view, but it's a, a view critical of the Prime Minister and entirely supportive of a rogue Governor General contemplating the dismissal without warning of a Prime Minister and a government who retained the confidence of the House of Representatives. Now, this is that's why I went to that letter. It is the critical letter to me. And it quite simply should never have been written. Charter should have maintained the claimed political neutrality of the crown, essential to a constitutional monarchy, to which Buckingham Palace claims the Queen adheres. And instead, the Queen had expressed a view antithetical to that of the Prime Minister, whose advice she was bound to follow. Let me turn quickly to the final letters, because these are the most critical, and, and in my view, the most egregious. Um, Charteris is, is, is here aware that Kerr is waiting for the advice of the Crown Solicitor, the, sorry, the Solicitor General, Sir Morris Byers, and the Attorney General on the powers of the Governor General to dismiss a government. He's aware of what they are likely to tell him, which they do, which is that there's a question over whether they even exist, and that if they do exist, there's no place to actually engage them at this point, since supply had not even been voted on in the, in the Senate yet, it had simply been blocked. And since Whitlam was offering perfectly proper constitutional advice to call a half Senate election. So in, that, in one of the final letters on the 4th of November, 1975, um, Charteris, who is not a lawyer, I point out, tells Kerr that the contested and controversial reserve powers do exist. He writes to him that you have the powers is known. Now he writes that 
knowing that the, that the Attorney General and the Solicitor General have advised Kerr differently because Kerr has informed him of that or are likely to advise him differently the week before. So I would ask the question, to whom was it known? To whom was it known that Kerr had reserve powers to dismiss a government? It was not known to the Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam, who always asserted there was no power at that point in the political crisis. The Attorney General or the Solicitor General, Sir Maurice Byers. In fact, Sir Maurice Byers later came out and said, the reserve powers are a fiction. And he said, you cannot have a reserve power of a Governor General to overrule the democratic decision through the House of Representatives of a popularly elected government. And that is why they do not exist, you know, 200 years since they were last, they were last used. Um, in a letter the following day, and you can see an added sense of urgency in this final letter, it's the final letter from Sir Martin Charters before the dismissal itself. And this is why it's important to read them all together. Um, uh, he, he is even stronger. Far from express urging caution, as some people have claimed in this letter, what Charteris does is he assages a, a concern that Kerr has previously expressed, that if he uses the reserve powers against the Prime Minister, it may damage the monarchy in Australia. He's expressed that view. He's actually specifically asked Charteris to give him his opinion on that. And what Charteris says is absolutely critical. This is the last letter before the dismissal. He says, if you do, as you will, what the constitution dictates, you cannot possibly do the monarchy any avoidable harm. The chances are you will do it good. And that's the final letter um, to Kerr before he goes ahead and dismisses the government five days later. And um, <clears throat> It's just an extraordinary set of letters to see the build up towards those final letters um, and Kerr's final decision to dismiss the government, which then follows. It was interesting to see that with the release of the letters which occurred in July this year, last year, Buckingham Palace issued a statement saying that the letters neither con confirm, sorry, the letters confirm that neither the Queen nor the Royal Household had, and I quote, any part to play in Kerr's decision to dismiss the government. Now, it's simply an extraordinary statement. It's, uh, I think, in fact, it's an insult to history. It's an insult to all Australians who worked so hard to access these letters, to read them, to read what they say, to read Kerr's view of what he called Sir Martin Charteris's advice to me on dismissal, and to have Buckingham Palace tell us that they show that the Queen had no part to play in Kerr's decision. No, no part to play in Kerr's decision is the one thing they do show. They show that they were clearly critical in Kerr's decision because he specifically asked them to have feedback on how it would affect Buckingham Palace and the monarchy if he used the reserve powers. It's, it's inconceivable that the palace has not acknowledged that they behaved um, improperly, the Charter should not have written these letters, he should not have engaged with Kerr, and at least we could move on. Instead, in my view, they continue to deny the history that we've worked so hard to make public in the last few years. I think at the same time they reveal what's an intractable flaw in our political system, because what you see there specifically around Kerr is that his concern for the monarch, and he's very specific about this after the dismissal, he placed his concern for the monarch, the monarchy and himself ahead of his responsibility to Australian democratic governance and certainly ahead of his responsibility to the elected government and the prime minister. And what's intriguing throughout the letters is that there's absolute absence of any discussion of the advice that, Kerr act that Whitlam actually gave, which was the advice to call the House in an election. It's as if it simply doesn't exist. There's no discussion of it. And there's no discussion of the need for Kerr to seek that advice or even to speak to his prime minister about it, which is the central function of a governor general, to counsel, to warn, to advise. Kerr does none of those things and the palace knows that he is doing none of those things. Let me finish with some questions about the archives. As I said earlier, the whole case has raised some troubling questions about the role of the Australian archives in fighting so strongly access 
to these incredibly important documents in our history. And it's not just a question of cost, close to $2 million at a time of depleted resources and dwindling staff. Um, but it's also over the, what you see elsewhere is the increasing role of the archives as a filter and not a facilitator of public access to historical documents. Um, Professor Frank Bongiorno, for example, said that after the Palace Letters case, it leaves the archives claim to be a pro-disclosure organisation in tatters. And it certainly does. And when you read the Palace Letters, the book, you will understand why that is, because there's far more nefarious activities by the archives behind the scenes that I haven't gone into today. So I'll try and end on a positive note, which is this. Uh, and that is that the great, I think, and lasting significance beyond the dismissal itself of this case is that it is a precedent now for opening up other royal documents. We know that because the archives have told me they will release soon uh, the governors general's letters to the queen from all governors general from Lord Casey on. There's a, there's a, I think a 50 year period there of really important royal letters we're going to have released because of this case. So it has a significance beyond just the immediate case. Um, I know that in the UK, for example, the British Republic group is looking at uh, mounting a case against the Royal Archives for a lease to their historic letters, drawing on this palace letters decision and the case as part of their argument for their release. Um, and I think it's starting a process now, it's part of a process that has been going on for a long time, in which in a democratic nation, we cannot retain what is essentially an arcane notion of royal privilege over archives. We don't have a secrecy act that says royal materials are exempt from public knowledge. And that's what's slowly being worn down by this decision. And I call on the archives, which is still yet to release those governor gen other governors general's letters to the queen, despite saying they would to me last year. I call on them now to make good their claim to be a pro-disclosure organization and to release its vast royal records of which it has an enormous amount and to release it in full, unredacted in the interests of our history. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Bruce, will you perhaps um, call on some of the questioners to uh, um, repeat their questions or to ask their questions to Jenny? Yeah, thanks, Glenda. And thanks, Jenny. That was absolutely, um, it's astounding, uh, the, the work you've done and, and its implications. And um, um, yeah, that, that's sort of my first comment. I have a few questions myself, but I'll, I'll um, throw over. The, the only one actually, the only question we've got in the chat at the moment is mm -hmm. from Trudy Wise. And I'd be happy, Trudy, for you to unmute and to ask it yourself. Uh, thanks very much, Bruce. And thanks so much, Jenny. That was absolutely fascinating and so important, just incredibly important for our history. Um, you, you just you talked just before about the palace having denied that they um, had any influence or gave any advice to the Governor General. Was that before the publication of your book? And have they has the palace responded since the publication of your book? Uh, no, they haven't responded to my book. I, I'd welcome a response. That would be marvellous. <laughs> but uh, no, they they responded very quickly to the release of the letters, um, immediately damp dampening down you know, what was pretty obvious, I think, to most people that the letters showed a scandalous level of engagement uh, and prior knowledge of, at the very least, the prospect of dismissal. Um, they may not have known the date at which it was going to occur. They may not have known the time. I mean, um, however, of course, they knew of that possibility. Um, so they, and more than that, as, as Turnbull said, you know, many of the letters clearly show them encouraging Kerr to do so. Um, uh, I mean, they're, they're shocking. There's no other. They're, there's no other word. If these letters had come out at the time, I mean, it, it's just unimaginable the outcry that would have released that, and that's of that would have met that would have met with, and that's why, of course, they denied that they ever discussed these matters. So they got out very quickly with a statement saying it, it's almost word for word the same statement they made after the dismissal. There are many, many letters in Kerr's papers and elsewhere. And in fact, people sent me letters they'd written to Buckingham Palace at the time, e expressing their real distress and dismay that, that someone called the Queen's representative 
could have done this. And the palace put out a statement almost in the same terms as what you see after the release of the letters today. So it's as if, which is that they had no part to play in the decision that Kerr made. It's as if the last 20 years of revelations haven't happened. They've simply trotted out what they always say. It doesn't matter what is revealed. If you look back at the Mountbatten revelations in recent years, the revelation only this year from the Guardian of the Queen using uh, the Queen's consent power, uh, assent power in the UK to vet legislation before it goes before Parliament. Um, they simply deny what everybody knows is on the record now. And it's, I think that's a very troubling aspect of, of, the, of the palace. Um, but no, they haven't commented on the book. Uh, thanks. Um, there's also a question in the chat from Chris Emery. So Chris, would you like to um, ask that question yourself directly? You've got to unmute, Chris. Uh, I was wondering just how relevant it is that the head of the archives is a political appointment. Um, look, I, I think probably more relevant in my view is that he's a former uh, a director, a deputy director general of ASIO. Um, and the reason I raise that is not as, um, you, you know, any personal slight, but simply that I think there's a mindset that has been formed in a previous place of employment um, that perhaps doesn't fully grasp what a historian would see as the significance of public access. And the default position always under the Archives Act was of release. It's almost as if this has been turned around that previously um, materials that came within the open access period of either, you know, it's now reducing to 20 years, it was 30 at the time, would be open unless some very clearly specified exemptions could be made. It's mm. almost as if now, and Fricker talks in terms of declassifying documents. We're not declassifying documents. They should simply be open. And it's, the, the owner should always be on the archives to show why anything is redacted. And now they use this catch-all that um, uh, if there's anything personal in documents, they can be redacted. If there's anything that might embarrass not only the individual who wrote them, but their family, you know, they're using what seems to me to be the broadest possible interpretation of the act um, uh, to, to deny access. And in some ways, far more important than that, I think, is that they've been so run down financially um, that they simply are not dealing with materials. You, I have about 20 things I've asked for and other researchers will tell you the same. I've been waiting for a decade, a decade. You know, under the Act, they're required to release them after 90 days. And what they do is they say, we're sent them off to other, other agencies. And the other agencies apparently aren't given a timeline. They're just told, well, you're still looking at them. Well, that's tough. And this is a long-winded way of saying, yes, I think there is a problem in the nature of the appointment, but I don't think it's because it's a political appointment per se, Chris. I think it's because of who they put in that position. It's interesting that when Whitlam made the archives a standalone body, um, now in its own institutional base in Canberra, he appointed a historian as the first Australian archivist. Um, and that's a critical difference, I think. You know, when you look at this as a matter of history, you have a very different uh, approach from when you look at it as a question of am I declassifying documents? Even the language itself, I was shocked to see that that was the language now used where we used to refer to opening documents. Mm, thank you. Um, Nada, Nada Flatko, uh, would you like to ask your question, please? Sorry. Um, Professor Hocking, do you think conspiracy is a reasonable description of the engagement between Kerr and the palace? Conspiracy is a very interesting word that's been um, used a lot in relation to the dismissal and, you know, not unreasonably, I think. It depends on, of course, how you define conspiracy. But if you look at conspiracy as two or more people doing things in secret to effect a particular end, 
Then there are several conspiracies happening at once, one of which is between Mason and Kerr. You know, these were things they actively sought to keep secret and there were letters between not only them, but between Kerr and Sir Garfield Barwick about Mason, indicating that that was a very conscious, clear decision. We will keep that from history. Mason told me that himself, I interviewed him. Um, you know, is that a conspiracy? Does that mean that it's a conspiracy of two? Um, I think certainly with the secrecy involved in this and the fact that the nature of their discussions was about the use of the reserve powers to dismiss a government, um, the, it's from Kerr's part, certainly, Kerr engaged in several conspiracies. I wouldn't want that to suggest that there's anything as crass as an instruction. You know, I think people who want to read this to mean, oh, but there has to be a letter saying, dear Sir John, would you sack Goff? It's absolutely ludicrous. Of course, they don't work that way. Um, and there was never going to be such a letter. I mean, this is put up by monarchists who want to be able to then say, oh, look, there's no letter saying sack Goff, therefore nothing happened. It's a complex way in which they work. I think they certainly conspired to deceive Whitlam. I would say that without any doubt, because it, it, they know that that prospect is, is uh, being considered by Kerr. They know that Kerr is being buoyed by the palace in terms of him having the power. They direct him to read the work of Eugene Fawzi, who was a Canadian senator who wrote extensively on the power of a governor general to remove governments. You know, the, 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 the suggestions are there and Kerr. What was most important to Kerr was that he not upset the palace. And what Charteris is doing is making it clear to Kerr that if he dismisses the government, the palace will not be upset. You will do it good. Um, and so on that level, there's a level of conspiracy in keeping the material secret from Whitlam and protecting Kerr as he moved to, towards doing that. Um, if I might ask a question myself, uh, Jenny, um, just wondering whether, and you may not be able to answer this, it's a legal question really, but whether uh, as a result of your case, the definition of personal communication as opposed to political communication in this sort of context might have changed legally and whether that will have implications on uh, the accessibility of such documents in the future. Well, look, as far as, as I can see, yes, it will, because this was part of the legal argument. And I, I went to every day of the court cases, of course, and also, you know, read everything extensively. And it was part of the argument, certainly put by archives, that if we allow, you know, this notion of personal to be changed at the archive level, it will feed into what politicians, for example, are saying, no, no, you can't access this, it's personal. So it will have other ramifications. This is why, as I said before, the the impact of the legal decision is a really significant one beyond the immediate case itself. Um, but I mean, there's, you could confine it by saying, well, in this particular context where there are two individuals so clearly at the top of a constitutional monarchy in that institutional sense, there's no notion of personal. It cannot be, you know, in that, particularly in relation to such a volcanic time in our history, they're discussing the potential removal of a government. Um, and so you, you know, there could be an argument made that that it's um, that it's only applicable to the partic particulars of that circumstance. But I've long argued, and what I would like to see is that the archives changes entirely the way in which it deals with personal records. It's a huge problem, and if people are going to lodge papers and then say they're personal and no one can access them, I mean, frankly, that's bollocks. That if they're going to use our national archives and our public facilities to store their records, then they should become part of the Commonwealth records that are looked after by the archives. You should not be in a position of placing your own terms of access over letters held in our archives. I mean, the archives already can't deal with the Commonwealth records it does hold, let alone taking other people's materials and then saying, but no one can look at them. You know, this is, this is where the personal notion, I think, in the archives, which is not in the Archives Act, has to actually be brought into the Archives Act. That's what I'd like to see. And I think, I think I know that there are moves towards that. And I think if we have a change of government, I'm very hopeful that personal records will then become a part of um, the broader sweep of records 
um, held as Commonwealth records and, and they should be. We should never have had to take a four year legal action um, at such great expense to the public purse um, to access what are clearly the most important historical records about the dismissal probably for decades. Thanks, Jenny. Um, Peter, I, I hope I pronounced this right, um, Gersbach or Gersbach, um, you've got a question. Would you like to ask that? Looking for the unmute button. <laughs> Found it. Um, Professor, it's mechanics of the dismissal is well known, but I've written in my question here, is there any indication at all in the letters that the opposition, I suppose, were unable to accept that an alternative government was acceptable in Australia after them being in power for 23 years? Did they perceive the Labor government, I know it ran from three years or four years or something, did they even accept the Labor government was legitimate? Well, no. I mean, we know from public statements at the time that they just did not. And um, I've written about this quite extensively in Whitlam's biography that I think one of the immense problems Whitlam faced was that simple fact that there had been no Labor government for 23 years, that pretty much for the whole, not entirely, but most of the post-war period, um, the Conservatives had, the coalition had been in office. And far more than people saying that, you know, the Labor Party was not accustomed to government, far more important, I think, is that the coalition was not accustomed to opposition and they would not accept it. You know, Reg Withers, their leader in the Senate, said almost immediately in 1970, early 1973, that they did not accept this as a legitimate outcome of the electoral process and that the Senate would be working to use its numbers in the Senate to bring down the Whitlam government. And you might think that after, they were very public about this, and you might think that after Whitlam was re-elected, which everyone forgets about in, in May 1974, you know, an historic second term with barely unchanged numbers in the House and picked up three Senate seats. So actually, they were level in the Senate after that election until the tainted removal of senators subsequently. Um, you might think that they would at last allow the government to govern. But no, they continued and said, we have numbers in the Senate, we will use them. We do not accept what he called the aberrant decision of the electorate of Australia. It, 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 they found that immensely difficult and just refused to accept that legitimacy in that, in that political sense. What you do see in the letters is that there's a correlating difficulty in the UK in having to deal with a whole new type of government. And so the really intricate networks that had been set up through the, the, the High Commissioner, for example, they'd had so Alec Downer for years, um, and, uh, they'd had as the Australian uh, High Commissioner to London, um, Sir John Bunting, who, who um, was subsequently over there, was of course a, um, a former private secretary to, to uh, a former head of the PM and C under Menzies. Um, you had this intense Menzian connection that I think was really the last gasp of these individuals that that resisted Whitlam at every opportunity I mean I could go I, I could go into chapter and verse on that but a lot of that is in the dismissal dossier the book before the palace letters and again in the palace letters that some of the some of the correspondence and the the details and the memos in the British archives the UK archives for example their internal discussions about Attorney General Lionel Murphy's visit in 73 about Gough Whitlam's visit. It's disparaging, condescending, um, insulting. They're, they're, they're quite extraordinary to read. And I think, yes, that happened here, but you know, there's a more than just elements of that in the in the UK. There's a it's almost like the last gasp of that sort of Menzian uh, post-Empire connection um, that was so close, so tight. Um, and very antithetical to, for example, the honours system being, being changed, to M Whitlam's efforts to remove the last state appeals to the Privy Council, the change to the Queen's titles. Um, 
they were deeply unhappy about a lot of things. They were very unhappy about the end of the White Australia policy because what everybody forgets is at the other end of the White Australia policy is not just discrimination against people, it was preferential treatment for British subjects coming over here. And they were furious <laughs> to see those privileges ending and no element of race or nationality coming into the, into the Immigration Act at all um, from that point on. So yes, a lot of pockets of resistance that I think you could see building up towards a dismissal where Whitlam didn't realise that and couldn't possibly have known that conversations and backroom change of discussion were happening um, around and behind the formal official ones. In effect, there was an equivalent network running alongside Whitlam's. There, there certainly was at, at times, and that's clear from some of these records. I mean, I'll just give you one example. After Billy Snedden was Liberal leader um, in, I think, 73, um, the then Prime Minister, the UK Prime Minister, um, it enters into discussions with him, but makes it very clear to Snedden, do not mention these, do not make these public, you, will, you know, and tells him, do not send anything through the Australian High Commissioner, send them through the dispatch uh, 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 bags so that they avoid going through Whitlam's appointment as the Australian High Commissioner, John Armstrong. So they actually literally set up another means of discussion with the leader of the opposition. And they say Whitlam will be furious if he, if he hears that we're in discussion with the leader of the opposition. And, and that's as early as in 73. So there are elements of that going through the whole time. And as I said, that's, I detail that in, um, at some length in both the biography and the dismissal dossier. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, could I, Jenny, just Bruce. ask a, a, a question about logistics? Um, how long did it take for a letter to go between um, England and Australia in those days? And also a sort of perhaps related question, do we know if there was any phone communication between the palace and the governor general? Well, yes, there was definitely phone communication, no doubt about that. Um, and that's the other side of the letters is, you know, how much of this is also being discussed in, in, in what they call private phone conversations. There are no, there are no telephone logs, which is interesting. Haslux papers, the few that I've seen, do indicate that there's a log of um, any calls coming between the palace and, um, and government house. And Haslux was a meticulous record keeper. Um, and it's very interesting to compare his letters and his notes. Um, the very few that we've had, and I've only been able to see a few, they're very haphazard in what they release, but they make it clear there are phone calls. You see referred to at different times in the letters, you know, I spoke to you about this yesterday in our call, this sort of thing. So it's clear that there are letters, that there are conversations by phone. Um, and I've also found references to very specific telephone conversations elsewhere. Um, as far as length of time, these letters all went, as far as we know, in the, in the, um, in the diplomatic bag, in the dispatch bags, um, and they were sent every night. So they might take two days, that sort of thing. They weren't going by the usual mail service. Um, they went in, Kerr often refers to, I have to get this in a bag overnight, you know, that sort of thing. So we do know that that's how they were, how they were being received and sent. Thanks. Uh, Peter Krauss, uh, and I'll, I'll just say um, we've got one more uh, question after Peter's and I think we might uh, end it there. Do you think, Gwenda? Um, yes, probably. Yes, I okay. think so. Yes. yes. Okay, so uh, Peter, would you um, please ask your question or comment? Thanks for that. Jenny, fascinating stuff and uh, very impressive. Um, I, I'm just intrigued by the miniseries and I, I have vague memories of that uh, 1983 miniseries uh, and I know it was done pretty much as a, as a straight version of the events that happened at the time, but I'm trying to remember, uh, especially with John Mellian playing John Kerr, whether there was any hint at all about uh, some of this correspondence and the advice that was being received from uh, the palace? Um, I don't think so. I must say what an appropriate choice it was to have John Mayen playing. <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. I mean, look, as I said, in very general terms, it was known that the governor general writes and keeps informed the palace. That, that had always been a standard thing. Kerr mentioned that in his memoir. But no indication of the nature of these really volcanic 
uh, letters that are, you know, to most historians, absolutely explosive in, in, in their content. Um, no, nothing, nothing at all, because all parties pretended they didn't exist. And as with all archival things, until you find them, you have no option but to go with what you know and what is on the record. And I've always done that, but it's always been clear that there are gaps. Um, and I think, you know, you really need to have a new version of that mini series uh, because so much more is now known. We would have several other key protagonists now, whereas at that time we always were told, I think everybody suspected that there was more, um, but we were always told that Kerr made this decision in his lonely, anguished um, way on, uh, 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 um, without any input from others. Now, you know, that's been revealed as the nonsense many people thought it was, but the role of the palace, well, it was just something that I don't think was even on the agenda until I located really um, Kerr's papers uh, indicating that that was a significant part of it. Thanks for that. And that, that feeds into my issue that I've had for quite a long time, that Australian film and television deals with our politics very badly. Well, yes. Um, I think at the time, though, I think they dealt with that actually with what they had. Um, and, and, you know, I think for something as contested as the dismissal, it is better rather than speculating to deal with what you have. There were clearly unanswered questions, but the extent to which the answers might involve the palace, you know, nobody, I don't think anybody thought of it at that time because it was just so, in, so insistently put that that could never happen. The queen is politically neutral. They are not involved. They never discuss these matters. I was told even on the day the letters were released that they would say nothing other than thank you for your letter I'm glad that your health that your health is well. Do pass on my best wishes to your wife. Not a single letter can be characterised in that way, and that's why I think we do now need another version or at least an update <laughs> of that series. Okay, uh, we've got a question uh, from Evan. Uh, I can't see you, Evan, but um, I'm sure you're there because you made a few comments along the way as well. So over to you, Evan. Uh, yeah, thanks, Bruce. Um, I'll get a bit closer because the microphone and the headset doesn't work, but I'll get a bit closer to the computer. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. great. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Jenny. Um, yeah, good to see you again after last year. Um, just wondering, was Gop around for most of your research for your two early books? Yes, he was around um, until the dismissal dossier. So um, I interviewed him at some length uh, for the biography. Uh, and um, I've actually written three biographies. This is the first one in which the subject was alive and that was a, an extraordinary experience to be able to talk to him at, at length and to you know, get a sense of his own uh, view on the things that I was looking at. Um, he didn't see either of the volumes of the biography before they were finished. I was very clear on that it was my book it was not his <laughs> and you know he's a pretty forceful character but he was a terrific uh subject because he never put you know he never never indicated any unhappiness with that it was always the beginning it was my book this is uh, if he would be interviewed that's good if he didn't want to be interviewed the book would be written anyway uh so that was a fantastic relationship um the one thing we talked about after the book was out the first volume at great length was the fact that I'd found also in the archives, and this is why I love archives, the fact that his grandfather as a 19 year old had spent four years in Pentridge prison. Mm. Uh, the only time I've seen Gough Whitlam uh, uh, so shocked that he was silent. And he was just <laughs> absolutely, absolutely thrown and quite distressed that he didn't know this. Um, so, you know, sometimes in biography, you find things that become a part of your subject's history. And that was pretty amazing. So, you know, one of the things that I find very poignant about both the Mason revelation, which I did tell Whitlam, he was very unwell by then, but I had found that and I told him that. I have to say he was really distressed, really, really distressed. Um, and he had no idea. He'd always held Mason up as the the archetypal 
chief justice who was neutral, who would never engage in what Sir Garfield Barwick did. Now, Barwick yeah. only read the advice from Kerr two days before he did it. See ya. Mason Pretty wanted to go for months, for many, many months. Yeah. And Goff was shattered personally and I think in terms of what he believed uh, uh, of Mason. Um, and it was quite moving to see his reaction. I think one of the really sad things about all these revelations about Kerr speaking to the palace in such detail about the possibility of dismissing Whitlam and talking about how the palace would react if he was recalled from office is that again, despite what had happened to him, Whitlam just could not believe this was even possible. He told journalists, there's absolutely no way the palace knew anything about this. And I remember one interview where he said, I mean, if they'd had even a suggestion that Kerr was thinking of dismissing the government, she would have said, have you spoken to your prime minister about this? And he yeah. said, do you doubt that? Do you doubt that she would have said that? And of course, that's precisely what they never said to Kerr. Have you spoken to your prime minister about this? They knew that he hadn't. And, and I think the failure of the archives to release these 30 years ago when they should have robbed Gough Whitlam of the opportunity to know just how extensive this was. Yeah, that's and what I'm thinking myself. So, yeah. yeah, and that's a shocking indictment of our archives. They yeah. should hang their heads in shame, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> Rightly so. Um, thank, you. thank you, Jenny. Thanks. I actually had missed a couple of questions in the chat and the, uh, the next one uh, from Marie actually follows beautifully from your last remark there, Jenny. So uh, over to you, Marie. Yes, uh, sorry, oh, you're breaking up. Um, um, Marie, Marie, you're breaking up and we can't hear you. So how about I ask the question? Um, yes, good idea. Yeah, <laughs> all right. Actually, you sound good now, but I'll do it just in case. So, Jenny, were you surprised when the director of the archives presented the letters himself in a press conference as if it had been his idea to release them? Uh, well, surprised is probably a polite way of putting it. Um, I was actually devastated. Um, and I'm more devastated and furious now than I think I was at the time. I just wanted to see the letters, you know, I was just still astonished and so pleased by the High Court decision. But yeah, look, I'd spent a long time um, and then a very long court case, which was arduous in a lot of ways and very exciting as well. And they arranged this after fighting so strongly at every step of the way, they arranged this public release with the Director General of the National Archives and did not ever inform me. I was told by a journalist who'd been invited to the release. And, you know, to say it was disrespectful would be an understatement. It was, it was absolutely appalling. And, you know, I, I think it's churlish, it's offensive, what it enabled and the point of it was really the point of the dismissal narrative from the beginning, which was to set the narrative that the archives wanted, which was, there's nothing in this. Look, you know, nothing to see here. Um, they quoted letters written after the dismissal to say from Sir Martin Charteris, thank you for not, in capitals, <laughs> informing me of your decision to, to dismiss the government. Forget everything that came before. Just look at this one letter afterwards. I mean, the whole thing was a charade, as I write about in the palace letters in this uh, excellent book. And it was tremendously disappointing. I think for David Fricker, the, the Director General, to make that decision is a really appalling misjudgment, a professional misjudgment. He ran that himself. Not only is he, you know, he's not even a historian, um, but he was the person who'd contested the release of the letters. And he acted as though this was a decision of the archives. It was shocking, no, no doubt about it. And yes, I'm, I was shocked and now I'm really, really cross, <laughs> but I'm used to it. What still continues to anger me and everybody is free to write to the Director General of the Archives and ask for this to be corrected. 
if you look at the very public profile statement about the palace letters where the letters are all released on the if you just type in palace letters national archives it'll go straight to this site the background to the release of the letters is that in may 2020 the director general of the national archives decided to release the palace letters there is no mention of a court case no mention of the queen's embargo no mention of the high court decision and i've written to the archives and asked them to be true to history and to put that in there and they won't and I, I it's you know it's it's appalling um and and i think this gets to the troubling nature of what all of this reveals and what many other people are now finding with archives have they shifted from being an open access organization charged with facilitating access to key documents in our history to one which is now actively filtering that history that is the great worry here Uh, thanks. We've got one last question and we really are running out of time. Um, so I'll throw over to uh, Mike McKeon. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Jenny. Th 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 thanks. thanks very much, Professor Jenny. Um, there's been revelations just recently that Bob Hawke was uh, really buddy buddies with the CIA, which a lot of us uh, older lefties probably suspected all the while anyway. Um, did you find any evidence in your all of your research um, that he was complicit in uh, white anting Whitlam? No, look, he was no, not not to that extent, Mike. I think you know there's no secret that they were very different politically, Whitlam and Hawke. Um, Whitlam was such an extraordinary party man. You know, he he was very reluctant to uh, undermine his own party, even though he was furious with Hawke about certain things that Hawke backtracked on, in particular, the free tertiary education. He's absolutely distressed by that decision by Hawke. But um, Hawke appointed Whitlam as the Australia's ambassador to UNESCO, and that was a brilliant decision um, because Whitlam made a real impact on that international stage. And I think it saved him from the sort of you know, really personal um, devastation he was still feeling about the dismissal after leaving Parliament. Um, and it was a fantastic appointment. So yes, they had their political differences. Um, I mean, I think in terms of the CIA, of course, intelligence communities were uh, very concerned about aspects of the Whitlam government. I mean, that's all on the record and in particular around um, questions around Pine Gap. Whitlam was never gonna, you know, tear up the Pine Gap agreement. But he did want Pine Gap to be a lot more amenable to some sort of accountability process in Australia. That's what he was railing about. Um, and many of them came to a head at that point. But I, I think in terms of the immediate pressures on Kerr and his own interests, um, you, you don't need to look any further than what the palace letters now tell us very, very clearly, which is that he did what he did, as he said, after the dismissal, to protect the monarchy. Um, and that's what he saw. He took his job literally as the rep Queen's representative here in Australia and he acted accordingly. And the letters show us how he reached that point. And it was one in which, again, to quote Frank, Professor Frank Bogdino from ANU, the palace was a player. Bruce? Okay, I think it's time we finished. Um, I'll, I'll take the chair. I want to thank Jenny Hocking enormously for this afternoon, particularly for highlighting the important role of the archives and their duty of openness and, and uh, transparency. That's something that's incredibly important for all of us. And for her amazing 10-year battle to reveal the full truth about this huge constitutional crisis in our country. And I also want to thank Bruce Watson for managing the technical side of events today. I hope it won't seem facetious, but um, when Jenny and I were preparing for this talk today, I, to I made her laugh because I told her that I often think of her as our Joan of Arc, which would make her laugh heartily. And, uh, but I don't take it back because <laughs> I think uh, both women were relentless in their determination to consider who shall rightfully run and govern our country. So for this and for everything,
I thank you very much, Jenny Hocking. Oh, thank you, Gwenda. That's very, very generous of you. I've known Gwenda for a very long time and we've worked on a lot of things together and I thank you for that great support and that lovely comment. I will carry that with me. Not necessarily on horseback. But <laughs> <laughs> great. Thank and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bruce, for helping me through the, uh, the technical um, uh, uh, presentation, aspect of the presentation, and to all of you for coming. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.